Hello and welcome to Disseminate, the computer science research podcast. I'm your host, Jack Wardby. I'm delighted to say I'm joined today by Horan Ma, who will be talking about his OSDI 22 paper, Memliner, Lining Up Tracing and Application for a Far Memory Friendly Runtime. Horan is a PhD student in the Department of Computer Science at UCLA, and his research has recently focused on systems. Horan, welcome to the show. Hi, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> it's our pleasure. Let's dive straight in then. So can you start off by explaining to the listeners what farm memory techniques are and why they're appealing to use in data centers? Uh, yes, of course. Um, so basically, um, farm memory means that there is one level of memory that is lower than currently widely used local DRAM. Um, I can give some examples. For example, um, non-volatile memory could be regarded as one kind of far memory. Um, another example could be like uh, using uh, RDMA, remote direct memory access. It is like there are two servers. The host server is um, usually equipped with very strong cores and some amount of memory. It can use local memory as some kind of cache and it accesses remote memory through some kind of um, special high-speed network, uh, such as, as I just said, RDMA over infinite band. But um, actually, but actually, the um, accessing, accessing data on remote memory is still slower than accessing data in local memory. That's why like, we call it far memory. It's slower, so it's far. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and it, actually, it is uh, the most widely used in data centers because of, um, currently, the data centers uh, have some uh, memory capacity bottleneck problem. Um, that problem is like, uh, so basically the growing of processor computation now is actually faster than the growing of memory capacity, uh, especially in recent years. Um, so we need a way to still like increase the memory capacity. So we have this kind of, this kind of um, far memory techniques. And at the same time, um, the memory in data centers is often actually underutilized. Okay. So it is. So it causes a big resource waste. Um, but if we have the, this kind of far memory techniques, um, we can utilize the free memory on one machine to satisfy the memory need on another machine. And in this way, we can like increase the uh, resource utilization in data centers. That's why kind of techniques are like uh, appealing to data centers. Awesome. So how do these um, far, far memory systems that, um, that exist at the moment, how do they currently operate? And what are aspects are, are there to them that are, are, are crucial to achieving good performance in a data center? Yeah. Um, so basically, currently, um, there are two main ways to use, to use the um, far memory systems. Uh, one way is that we let users or we let programmers to fully control the system. It's like, the programmer specify what kind of uh, data should stay on the remote memory or stay on the far memory or, and what kind of data should stay on the local memory. This is one way to use that. It, uh, the users can use some API or some interfaces to control that. And another way is to, that, to make this far memory systems transparent to programmers. It, it, it can like, uh, so basically the a family system act as some kind of swap system, uh, act as uh, like some cache. The local memory is some kind of cache, and the, the remote memory is kind of like uh, the main memory. And when the local memory is not enough, the the like the family systems can like just do the swapping and swap out to swap to swap out some like uh, code data and swap in the um, the data it needs to access automatically. And and I think currently the second way is the most um, popular one because you know the programs does not need to care about it, care about the details, and it can still like achieve pretty good ex performance. Though, actually, I think uh, if the programmers can control everything, of course, it can like uh, to achieve the best performance. But it would be like highly complicated. That's really interesting. So, you know, unlike Azure or AWS now, is there an API for me to go and actually? You said like the a user can actually get full control of the placement of of data. Is that actually exposed to users at the minute? Can I, as a just log on to AWS and and I have that API available for me? Uh, I think it's it's um, 
the API is kind of low level actually. Okay. Pretty low yeah. level. Is the, I like uh, in we, we can install some drivers and like to use that driver to control everything to maybe flash some data to remote side and fetch some data uh, to to the local side. So it's the programmer take care of a lot of details to do that. Okay. Then that's not very. Um, but there are a lot of like uh, current work to like simplify that. Yeah. But like the, the programmers still need to specify a lot of things. You know? Okay, cool, cool. So you say the second one's probably the most common common way of operating at the moment. So you, I, know, <laughs> I know in your paper you you said that you identify that in, in that sort of setup, garbage collection is a real problem. Can you yeah. can you kind of elaborate on why it is a problem? Yes, yes. Um, so. Um, so like in a lot of like cloud applications, so basically I, I, I would like to like start from the cloud applications itself. So cloud applications currently are most, uh, I, I would not say most, I, I would say like a lot of, to, to be like uh, accurate, a lot of cloud, <laughs> cloud applications uh, are written in uh, managed languages like Java, yeah. And um, in Java, it has some, some kind of uh, managed runtime to like manage the memory the application uses. And inside the runtime, the, the way to manage the memory is to you to do some garbage collection, to collect the um, garbage and to reclaim the unused space and to let the application use it. And for the for modern GC algorithms, it usually uh, uses some kind of tracing and evacuation uh, algorithm. The tracing means it starts from the root. So basically, um, in uh, so when we are writing applications, we, we know that we have like stack, we have heap, and the root means the stack variables. We start from the stack and to trace it from the root and then mark every object we can trace. So it is pretty like a graph traversal. And the object we marked is alive. And for other objects that we do, did not mark, is that because you know from the from the root we cannot access it? Then it means like we will never use it. We we have a we have no way to access it in the future. So um, uh, so this is what what GC is like, but this GC thing has a big problem. Why? Because it is as I just said, it is like a graph traversal. So it's it's like uh, it has has very little <laughs> um uh, locality. And the locality thing is very crucial to the performance in um, memory, memory systems. Because if the locality is good, then actually the, the prefetching and the, like, the catch and swap, it, would be, would, it, it is beneficial to that kind of um, uh, catch and swap system. And so we can see the, um, the uh, tracing is, is, uh, has very uh, bad locality. And the tracing itself, like the GC itself, we we'll also like compete with the applications for resources. So we know that the, if the tracing needs to trace some objects, it needs to firstly uh, like swapping it and trace it and then swap it out. And the application itself also needs to do that. It's in, when, when it is like being executed, it needs to swap the data it needs to use and then swap out it. And so, th so these two things will like, uh, uh, can currently compete with each other, like for for a lot of resources, like the uh, network bandwidth, the RDMA bandwidth, and also the local memory capacity. Um, and um, so, 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 like the GC would like highly interfere with the application itself. And actually, the GC would also like interfere with the application in another way. Uh, it is about the um, prefetching. So. As we know, like uh, in traditional uh, like swap systems, we can like do some prefetching. If we can identify the access pattern, we can like prefetch some uh, continuous objects, like in the in the following way, uh, and it can help uh, improve the performance. But because we now have the uh, tracing, we also have the application. These two kind of like access behaviors are very different, and they will like interfere with each other. And um, then the um, the prefetcher may not be like as useful as before, like if if we do not have 
uh, tracing. Actually, maybe the prefetcher can help uh, prefetch some objects for the application itself. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, I guess let's let's talk about Memliner then. So, what what is Memliner? I guess he's going to address this problem. So let's let yeah let, let's let's hear about it. Yeah. So uh, Memliner is like uh, so Memliner is a runtime technique solving the GC interference problem on disaggregated memory or on far memory. It mainly like lines up the tracing in GC and application itself to improve cloud applications performance on far memory. Yeah. I want to describe it like this. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So what, what were, I mean, we, I guess we've kind of touched on it a little bit when, when we spoke about the, the, pro, the, the problem that it's, that it's designed to solve, but what were your design goals when you were developing Memliner? Yeah, so um, I would say there are two main design goals for us. Um, the first one is that we do want great performance. <laughs> so, so the performance is the most important one, the most, perf- perf- the most important goal that we have. Yeah, and the second goal is that we still want a highly decoupled runtime from kernel. We do not like want to like make the kernel itself and the runtime itself like highly coupled because you know like as a like a programmer we want like some decoupled things to make it like better. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess that's so it's easier to reason about. I guess right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. So. What were Travis in achieving these design goals? What were the sort of the key ideas that underpinned Memliner to, yeah, as I said, to 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 achieve these these goals? So there, so we have two observations that motivate our design of Memliner, and um, so the first observation is that we do find that application and GC are not like completely unaligned. So we find that. The application and GC are just temporarily unaligned. Why? Because the um, the live objects actually traced by the GC itself are mostly accessed by the application at some point during the ap- execution. Because uh, the GC traces it, it is alive, so it will, so it will be highly possible for the application to access it in the future. And the objects accessed by the application must be live objects. Yeah, because it is being ac- accessed, so it is live. And it should also be the uh, like targets for the GC. So basically, these two kind of like uh, object sets are not like highly decoupled or like highly uh, unrelated. They are like actually related to each other. Mm. And the second observation we make is that changing the object access order in GC is possible. Like it was, though, like we uh, for application, we cannot like change its behaviors because it is like specified by the um, ap- uh, by, by the programmers, by the application developers. But for GC inside the runtime, we can control it. We can like trace it, trace the objects in different orders, like to make them related to each other. Okay, nice, nice. Mm-hmm. So, what were the sort of in kind of putting these ideas into into practice what were the challenges that you had to, to overcome and how did you go about how would you go about doing this yeah uh, as for the challenges I would say um, so as I said memliners uh, memliner it lines up the tracing and the application mm. so I would say for the biggest challenge here is that uh, how to line them up <laughs> yeah and um so what we do is to like uh, classify the objects into three categories: local objects, incoming objects, and distant objects. For local objects, we mean uh, this kind of objects is are currently being accessed by application threads. So for this kind of objects, the GC threads should touch them at once. And for incoming objects, it means the objects are still in remote memory, in far memory, but it will soon be accessed by application threads. And for this kind of um, objects, the GC threads should also touch at once because it will be used in the, in the near future. And um, if the GC threads touch them, it is being swapped in, but, but it will has no harm because in the, in the future, the application still needs to fetch them to the local memory. And the third category is the distant objects. It means that it is, it is in remote memory but it will not be accessed by application threads soon. 
And for that kind of objects, the GC threads should actually delay the tracing of them, delay the access of them. That's how we like line them up. But inside this process, there are still like some kind of like uh, small challenges. For example, how to inform the GC threads, the objects that are currently being accessed. And also um, like uh, how do we identify the objects that will be accessed by, by the application threads soon? And the third, uh, the third like uh, small challenge is that how to estimate the location of objects so that we know what kind of objects are distant objects and what kind of objects are not distant objects. Yeah, and um, like to make it simpler, so basically for the first challenge, how to inform GC threads uh, the objects that are currently being accessed, we basically use the barrier mechanism inside the round inside the uh, Java runtime. And um, that's, I, I would say that's the simplest answer. And um, for the second challenge, like oh, what kind of objects will be accessed by application start soon, we just like regard the objects that are a few steps away from the objects that are currently being accessed. We regard those kind of objects as uh, the objects that are going to be accessed. And um, as for the second thing, uh, how to estimate the location of objects, it would be kind of um, more uh, complicated than the previous two because we need to still like use the um, kernel mechanism to estimate the like they are if if the object is currently being uh, oh, sorry is if the current the the object is currently in local memory or not. So it is like more. Uh, this, this, this kind of work is uh, more heavily uh, rely on the um, uh, kernel side. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you see you got these um, three categories there with mm -hmm. the different types. Would would it benefit from having, we can maybe touch on this later on when we talk about the evaluation and, and, and whatnot, but it just jumped into my mind, like, are these three, why did you settle on having three categories? Would you benefit from having more or does that make it more complex or was this naturally just these are the three obvious categories things would fit into? Yeah, so basically the, actually the three objects, the three kind of objects are like categorized by our needs okay. because we need to line, line the tracing and uh, to line up the tracing and the application. And so we need to know what kind of uh, objects should be traced by uh, uh, like uh, at once, and what kind of objects should should not be traced at once? It should be delayed. And so the category, uh, so the criteria we classify different objects is based on that. Like, okay. we, uh, should we like uh, let the GCs that trace them now, or we should not trace them uh, like at once? We should delay them. Yeah, that's the criteria. Yeah. Okay, cool. So. I guess my next question is, how did you actually go about implementing this then? So can you talk us through your implementation and how that looks like and how, I guess how easy it was to implement this, right? Maybe, yeah. maybe there's some war stories there of how, how it was challenging or whatnot, but yeah. Uh, in terms of the implementation, it's, I would say it's mostly like to hacking the, uh, to hack the Java virtual machine. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of painful because uh, <laughs> I, I have to say there are not a, Currently, there are not a lot of like materials about the Java virtual machine implementation, so it would be like painful at the first. Um, but yeah, as I know more about the Java virtual machine, like it's it is more smoothly, and we uh, do implement the like our technique in two different garbage collectors in the in the Open JDK in the Java virtual machine, and um, um. I would say um, it's a great experience. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, 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 um, for as for the implementation, like after that, I I, I implement the um, our technique in the first garbage character. It is easier for me to implement in the uh, another one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because they do have like uh, some kind of similarities to each other. Yeah. So. I see. Yeah. And how big are the changes? Like, how big are the things you need to implement here? Is it quite, quite a sizable change, or is it? Yes, it's not like uh, some uh, little changes. It would be like um, inside the JVM. I forgot the exact number actually, but it should be at least like thousand, uh, like several thousands of lines oh, of okay. code. Okay, so it's non-trivial. Yeah, yeah. 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 
Okay, cool. Cool. So, yeah, I guess my next question is, how does how does Memliner compare with other like contemporary solutions? Like, what else is out there in the space that kind of compares and tries to solve a similar problem? And how does Memliner compare against this? Yeah. Um, so, for contemporary work, there are two kinds of them. So, the first kind is to, like, uh, improve the kernel. To to like to like the make the kernel swap system better to like it, to let it like swap in and swap out faster. This can also like uh, improve the performance of applications. But as as, as I just said, like um, the memliner is a runtime technique to like solve the GC interference problem. And um, so these two kind of work are uh, like very different from each other. Or I, I would say like the the work that improves the kernel. Can also be utilized, uh, like underneath the uh, memliner, because our, like I would say, our work is built upon them. We can use their subsystem, but there are kind of actually um, a, 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 another kind of work, or I would say, like uh, some of my previous work are in that category. It's like we want, uh, like we some uh, sometimes still solve the GC interference problem, but we want like to not line them up. We want we want to offload the GC part to remote memory side. It's like another way to solve this GC interference problem. Um, uh, but memliner's like advantage is that uh, it is uh, easy to use because we do not because if we like offload the uh, if we, if we offload the GC to remote side, the kernel and the, like the two machines are like highly coupled with each other. And for the current and we also need some. Kind of like kernel mem uh, kernel runtime co-design to make them like uh, highly efficient to swap in and swap out. I would say memliner is uh, memliner's advantage is to like you can easily use it okay. on every swap system. I see. I see. I guess this leads naturally into the, my next question as well. Then is how did you go about evaluating? Um, memliner and like what was the key question you were going to ask and like what did you this expert your evaluation experiments look like yeah um so for evaluation we basically compare uh, memliner so like the biggest evaluation part in our paper is like to compare memliner with unmodified jdk um on on uh, different swap systems on, on, or i would say on the same swap system and um we compare the performance of, the, of, of using Memliner and using uh, 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 unmodified JDK on, the, on a range of different applications. I remember we like compared them on 12 applications. It's a, <laughs> it's a huge application pool. Yeah, um, and we compare its throughput uh, to see like uh, how Memliner is faster than another one uh, on, on modified JDK. And besides, we also like do some experiments to see how memliner can help improve the uh, prefetching effectiveness. Because I just said the tracing itself can interfere with the application to like uh, to destroy the access pattern of the applications. Like that, that can be like uh, identified by the kernel itself. But if we line them up, actually we think the access pattern of the applications should be now clear to the kernel subsystem. <clears throat> so uh, we did some experiments to check that if if the uh, prefetching now is effective is more ex effective than before. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Just wanted to jump back a sec to these applications. Can you just briefly mm -hmm. get? I know this is a big application pool, so I'm guessing it covered a wide range of different types. But can you maybe give us a flavor of some of the applications that were um, used in the evaluation? Yeah. Uh, so the application uh, is more about is more like. Uh, um, the cloud applications that are currently being widely used in data centers. For example, the Spark, the Spark itself. We evaluated three different Spark applications. And also, we also evaluated uh, evaluate, um, Memlander on uh, Neo4j and uh, Cassandra. So basically, they are most uh, the um, big uh, cloud applications. From your uh, experiments, what were the key results and what were the highlights? I think our highlights is that um, we improve the uh, cloud applications by an average of 1.5 times speed up uh, than the um, unmodified JDK on uh, the same subsystem. 
yeah, that would be like the most highlight thing is like improve the performance and do not harm it, uh, something else. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the headline. <laughs> uh, that, that's really cool. So maybe we can dig into the, to the, to the results a little bit more. Then. So like what are the, some of the other things that were interesting that you found from your experiments? Mm-hmm. Maybe we can talk about like some uh, something about the uh, like the prefetching uh, prefetching effectiveness because I because I just talked about it. Yeah, for the prefetching effectiveness, actually we uh, evaluate memliner and the unmodified GTK on two different two different swap systems, and uh, or maybe I can see like two different uh, prefetchers, um, and we can see that for both the prefetching accuracy and prefetching coverage. For both of those two like uh, metrics, the memliner, is ma- the memliner's metrics are higher than unmodified GDK on both two swap systems, and I think that's um, also another like highlight result in our paper. Yeah, that's a really interesting result for sure. Are there any situations in when? Because at the moment it sounds like it's pretty much a free lunch memliner that it's always it, we can always use it to get better performance. Are there mm-hmm. any scenarios or for any applications where the performance is suboptimal? I guess what I'm asking here is what are the limitations of Memliner? Yeah, um, so basically Memliner still has some uh, like little overhead, but it's it, it, like in most cases it, it, it's negligible. Uh, and but um, like I, 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 as I um, introduced, um, the Memliner lines up tracing uh, in uh, like li- lines up tracing in GC and application itself. So, but, but you know, like uh, in some cases, the, uh, the application may not use that amount of, that, that, that large amount of memory. It might not trigger the, tri- the concurrent tracing in GC. And in that case, like Memlin has no use to it. <laughs> it, it, it is it is not useful. It can only like has some like very small overhead Though not big, but this is still, still like small, some small overhead, um, and it cannot help in, improve the performance of, like, of applications because this it, it does not trigger the traced, concurrent tracing in GC. So in that case, Memliner, I would say, is is not useful. <laughs> yeah. What is the magnitude of the overhead? You said it's really small, but can you maybe give us an example, like in terms of uh, uh, I don't know, an application that on some numbers um, of how. Small, how the overhead, how large the overhead is of in this scenario. So, like for the uh, mem- uh, for, for the memory amount. Mm. So, so basically, in I would I would take the uh, G one G C as an example. Okay. So, uh, so G one G C is the default garbage collector in OpenJDK, and the mechanism to trigger a concurrent tracing phase in G one G C is that the now the the used memory has reached some threshold, for example, 60% of the whole heap. And, uh, in, uh, but the G1 GC, it also has some kind of uh, like nursery GC to like continuously reclaim some memory, though it cannot reclaim the, like the a whole dead memory, but it still can reclaim some memory. So if like uh, the nursery GC is already enough to like keep up with the uh, application, to keep up with the ap- memory need of the, ap- of the application itself, then it does not need to like trigger the uh, concurrent tracing, like the memory amount, the, the memory usage never reaches up to like 60% or 50%. That's threshold. Awesome. Then concurrent tracing is not triggered and so the memory so mem- is not used, useful in that case. Awesome. awesome. So I guess it, it depends on like one of my questions I was going to ask you is if, as a software developer and whatnot, how do I go about using memliner? But I guess it requires me to to kind of understand and profile my application and see whether this would uh, benefit yeah. me. Okay, yes, sure. Yes. So is it? I'm guessing it's publicly available, right? Uh, yes, it's uh, open source on GitHub. Yeah. Okay. Is there any sort of long term plan of getting it merged into some version of the JDK, or is it always going to stay as a pretty much a research kind of prototype? So currently, our plan is to like uh, to make it like more like a research prototype. Okay. Um, but but we do want to like push it to uh, open JDK, but it would be like uh, pretty difficult. Uh, like it is it is not easy work because we need to make like make it highly robust, highly robust to use in every like uh, corner cases. Otherwise, just push it to open JDK would be like uh, not not, not <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> okay, cool. You know, so it is like widely used all around the world. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, if if it wasn't one hundred percent, I mean, it could could result in a lot of problems, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, right. So I guess well, while you've been working on this project, then what what do you think has been the most interesting um, lesson you've learned, and maybe something that kind of caught you off guard that you weren't really expecting to discover across this project? I think the most interesting thing in Memliner is like how we like come up with this idea. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, because uh, actually, before Memliner, we have a work that is called Samuru, and uh, the Samuru is kind of like uh, the idea of like offloading garbage collection to a remote memory site. And but when we are like developing memory, uh, well, sorry, when we are developing when we were developing the uh, Samuru, we found that. Why cannot we just like uh, to uh, have to have a like a, a tool that can just be used on a single machine without like to offload some computation to another one? And so then we come up with this uh, Memliner's idea to like and then to implement it to like develop it and to get it uh, published. I think that's the most interesting part because the memliners. I I have I have to say memliners idea is the like the idea of a memliner is the most important thing. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Inside it, um, but as for the implementation, it's just like you know just the implementation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. It consumes the most the most amount of time, but it's just the implementation. Yeah, that's always the case, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Cool. So I guess leading on from that. As you as you will know, like the progress in in research is very up and down. It's very nonlinear. Yeah. Things there's lots of up, ups and downs along the way, along the journey. So, from the initial conception of the idea for Memliner to the publication at OSDI, can you tell us more about that journey and were there things along the way that you tried that didn't succeed that maybe the listener could benefit from knowing about? Yes, uh, yes, actually there are. <laughs> <laughs> Many these kind of things, but um, um, I was I would uh, give uh, like a, an example, uh, like a, a, an example of it. Like at first, like when we like want to like inform the applications that what kind of objects that are currently being accessed, our initial idea is to like to capture the call sites inside the program. Like if the if if the program calls one function, and like uh, there is a call site, and the, in in the call site there would be some parameters. So at first we want, we want to instrument the call sites to capture the uh, like the uh, parameters and regard these parameters as the like some kind of rules uh, to like to trace bef- to trace from them, and this idea does not work. In our uh, final <laughs> implementation or in our final paper, because so firstly the instrumentation itself is too heavy, like it's too heavy, it incurs uh, uh, overhead, like significant overhead. So it, it is not acceptable, and also like the call set itself is not like the complete the is not complete set of the objects that are currently being accessed. Uh, yeah, it's it's like uh, because it, like if you have a very long function and it has no call, no 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 like internal uh, call sites, then we mean we may, we might not capture a lot. Uh, we might not capture any objects during that uh, execution time, and it is not like uh, good in our scenario. So finally, we give up that idea and then we go to use the barrier thing. So how far along, how long, how much time did you spend with the trying to instrument things before realizing this isn't going to work? This is just so much of performance overhead. Let's rethink it. Yeah, it's about two months. Incredible. One yeah. two months, yeah. End to end, how, how long was the whole process from like, from the, I'm thinking this is a great thing, we should do this, to finishing the implementation and everything? How long did that take? It was about one year. Yeah. Okay, yeah. The whole process is about one year. Yeah. Awesome, cool. Um, so I guess, what's next for Memliner? What, 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 where do you take the project next? So my next project is about, so basically Memliner, you know, we focus on runtime thing. And for my next project, I want to like focus on the application itself. 
or I would say focus on the language, because I want to like design some language types to uh, to make the uh, far memory or make the uh, remote memory highly uh, uh, highly efficient and also highly uh, easier, to, highly uh, or um, I would say uh, easily to be used for programmers. Oh, okay, so this yeah. would be something like, I guess, some sort of abstraction that allows the developer to you or the programmer to reason about the fact that this object is potentially going to be stored in far away memory and kind of develop use it, having the fact that you have that knowledge in your program, being able to I guess program using yeah. those primitives, right, could really yeah could lead to a lot of really interesting um, application yes, because, development. Yeah, yeah, I want pro uh, so basically so the programs knows that it is using remote memory. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's aware really of cool. that. Yeah, that's really interesting. That that yeah, I can see that being really useful for a lot of applications. <laughs> I'm very intrigued to see what research you uh, come up with. That's really cool. Um, awesome. So I, I guess like that's a really interesting, uh, um, really interesting idea. But uh, are there are the other? Can you tell the listeners about other research you've worked on across your PhD? Um, some of your other projects. I know you mentioned one earlier on. I quite quite remember the name. And um, they're kind of precursor to to Memliner. Maybe you can tell us a little bit yeah, about yeah. that. So yeah, during my research. Like before Memliner, I do have like worked on two other projects, Samuru and Mako. Uh, and these two kind of work are like some like uh, very similar to each other. The idea is like to just offload the GC, to offload the garbage collection to the remote memory side. But like for Samuru, it focuses on the uh, uh, throughput, focus on the performance. But for the second one, not only the throughput, we also focus on the like the pause time of garbage collection. You know, in um, runtime, if we do some garbage collection, sometimes we need to pause the application itself and do some work and then resume the application. But actually, we do not want the pause to be like very long. Otherwise, the you know when you are using some <laughs> applications, okay, the, it just freezes and then like <laughs> it is not acceptable. No, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so we want some like low pause garbage collectors and. Like it, in, like it imposes some other challenges to like uh, our settings. So, like my work, Mako is to solve that problem to still like uh, give a high high throughput but low low pause garbage characters. Yeah, oh, really cool. That's awesome. I will put a link to all that work in the show notes as well, so the interested <laughs> listener can go and can go and check that out. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in uh, trying to understand how you approach uh, generating research ideas and how do you how do you then select things to work on because obviously as you said before memliner for example took a year to implement it's a big commitment of your time to take an idea from the initial conception to the end so i just like to know more about your process for it for one generating ideas and then two selecting ones to pursue um so my uh so it's, it's it's kind of a personal experience, yeah, for me. Yeah. Um, uh, so my I, so as for my projects and ideas, it's more like a, so first I work on some uh, projects, uh, Samru, and then like along with them, I found that okay, the previous work has some limitations, or we can do it better, and then like okay, I come up with this idea, and then like implement. But 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 I have to say like my cri my criteria to like select projects or ideas is to like it is, should be like interesting enough it should be like novel enough otherwise you you know like if i like devote devote to it for one year but it is not like really novel thing then it's, it sometimes can be like uh, i would I, 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 I would sometimes like be sad uh, like be sad about my uh, like uh, yeah, projects um, but 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 if it is interesting enough, I would be like, uh, okay, I like this idea. I do love this idea. I think it will be uh, it, 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 it's, it's gonna work. I would be like confident. Yeah. Okay. So you kind of get this sort of internal sort of feeling about the project. I, I believe this yeah. is novel, and this kind of I guess the idea maybe like calls to you. I guess you could say, and you can yeah. feel you're very passionate. Oh, that's really interesting. That's really cool. It's, it's like I need uh, to love this idea. Yeah, you need to love it to then dedicate a year of your life working on it, right? You've got to have some faith in it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how did you end up researching in this area? What, how did you decide on this was the sort of stuff you wanted to research? So, <laughs> so it's like a, so I, would, I, would, I, would I would tell a story actually about it. So basically when I like uh, 
go to when I went to UCLA at the first year, it's a, it's like it's, it's 2019, yeah, and okay, and uh, the pro, uh, now the professor like a postdoc told me that okay, I have now like uh, three projects to work on because like I need to like follow someone at first to like know about the like the research, how the research is going, yeah, and like they gave they gave me like some project uh, ideas, I think. Uh, one is about the uh, like more like a machine learning system, and the other one is about like uh, video analytics, and third okay. one is about this uh, like memory de- disaggregation or far memory thing. And actually, at that time, I do not know, I know nothing about this far memory, but I do think like it is very innovative, or I would, I would say it's like it is like a whole new thing to me, and I want to like know about it. I want to dig into that area to know about it. So I joined that project, and then I found okay, I love it. I, this is interesting area. So, and then after that, I I, continue, I continuously work on it, and yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's that's a nice story. Yeah, it sounds like you found something that you really interest, yeah. that you're really interested in, which is which is awesome. And um, so, what do you think is the the biggest challenge in uh, in like far memory techniques at the minute like what what's the biggest challenge out there that needs tackling and needs solving um i have to say in like personally like uh, you know different people have different opinions about of the course, biggest right? yeah. challenge yeah. yeah so for me personally i would say the application semantics thing is currently like the biggest challenge in our in my like research area because uh, like um you know um if we like Memlang actually is some kind of uh, uh, to use some semantics in runtime to improve the performance. Like we know that the in the runtime we have GC and we use that knowledge to improve the performance uh, the, of applications on disaggregated memory. And actually, if we can know more about the application, like we know what the application would do in the future or what the application would like or maybe like what kind of data would be accessed by the application if we can know that then actually the kernel could could like uh, first swap in the like like actively swap in the data that is needed by the application but to make the kernel know that is very difficult because the application developer because only the application developers know what the application would do in the future or in the like in the next several seconds or in the next several hours and um like if we can have a way to like to express that kind of application semantics to convey the information to the kernel, then it would be like highly beneficial. Yeah. But this part is like very challenging, I have to say. Yeah, and that's what yeah. I thought the biggest challenge in my research area. Fantastic, that sounds amazing. Um, I guess this last question now. So mm-hmm. what is the one key thing you want the listeners of the podcast to take away from your research? I would say if you want to improve the performance of applications on your platforms, like you should not only focus on your platform, you should only you should also like foc- uh, take a look at the application itself or the interme- intermediate between application and your platform because that would be like sometimes that would be like highly beneficial. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Brilliant. And let, let's end it there. Thanks so much, Horan, for coming on the show. If you're interested in knowing more about Horan's work, we'll put links to all of the uh, all of his papers and whatnot on, in the show notes. And we will see you all next time for some more com- awesome computer science research. Thanks again, Horan. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> <laughs>